OpenAI has an AGI committee, while a VC-backed responsible AI declaration is generating some pretty significant blowback. Welcome back to the AI Breakdown. One of the things that we have been tracking here on the show is the increasing war of words between the AI safety or responsible AI community, however you want to define that on the one hand, and the accelerationist technology-based community on the other. Now, the rhetoric in this battle has increased in severity, commensurate with the fact that AI is now firmly on the policy agenda. In other words, the stakes have been raised on the AI safety conversation because it could turn into specific policies that, again, those accelerationists or people in the technology community would view as fundamentally limiting to what they can build or what can be built in general. Today, we're going to talk a lot about an example of how that war of words is playing out. But I want to start with something that was almost throwaway, but which I think is a little bit more loaded than it at first seems. So Sharon Goldman, who writes about AI for VentureBeat, tweets, OpenAI says its six-member board will decide when we've attained AGI, a threshold which excludes Microsoft. What does this timing, context, and process of that possible future decision mean for all of us? She continues, the information was highlighted by OpenAI's Logan Kilpatrick, who was responding to critics calling OpenAI an arm of Microsoft. Kilpatrick said Microsoft does, quote, get access to our models to use in their products, but they have no control over our strategy as a company. But the information also comes right after a new interview with Sam Altman in the Financial Times. Asked if Microsoft would keep investing further, he said, I'd hope so. There's a long way to go and a lot of compute to build out between here and AGI. Training expenses are just huge. Okay, so let's get into this a little bit more and why this whole Microsoft side of the conversation actually matters. First, what's important to understand about OpenAI's structure is that it's a little bit different. Basically, there is a nonprofit that owns all of the for-profit IP, and that in the case of this designation of attaining AGI, it has specific implications. As VentureBeat writes, thanks to a for-profit arm that is legally bound to pursue the nonprofit's mission, once the six members of its nonprofit board of directors decides AGI or artificial general intelligence has been reached, such a system will be, quote, excluded from IP licenses and other commercial terms with Microsoft, which only apply to pre-AGI technology. Now, as Goldman and VentureBeat point out, the definition of AGI is not something that there's a shared consensus around. Twitter user N. LaSol says, So basically, if you hear anyone from OpenAI announce that they've attained AGI in the near future, it doesn't mean a program that can solve problems as well as a human. It means a program we don't want to give to Microsoft. Nice goalpost shift, y'all. Now, of course, this relationship between OpenAI and Microsoft has had a ton of scrutiny. In a lot of ways, it's become a Rorschach test for how you feel about big tech and artificial intelligence in general. At the same time, it's undeniable that it has been influential in how the field has developed. We've subsequently seen big startup labs like Anthropic tie up with Google and Amazon. And if you listen to the brief this morning, you'll have heard why it seems increasingly like the big capital that's needed to train discrete models isn't really within the purview of venture capital and might have to increasingly come from these big existing corporate players. In that way, then, the OpenAI-Microsoft relationship is not just about OpenAI and Microsoft, but also about a proxy for the rest of the field. I often think when I look at commentary around this partnership, particularly commentary that suggests that something is going wrong or that there's been a shift or that one of the two partners is walking away from the other, and I tend to think that it usually reflects not so much that anything has changed in the relationship, but more just the fact that they've chosen an inherently messy relationship in the first place. These companies are, by virtue of this partnership, deeply tied together in ways that make the ways in which they compete much more uncomfortable. But at the same time, at no point have they called it a proto-acquisition or a semi-acquisition. To hear everyone talk, the companies are partners but still discrete companies. In other words, I don't necessarily think there's something mutually exclusive about the fact that on Dev Day, Sam Altman told Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella that he thought that their partnership was the strongest in tech. But at the same time, both OpenAI and Microsoft in their own right are doing things that wouldn't be in the best interest of the other partner. Basically, I think this is just a part of the messiness, and they're just going to have to sort it out as it comes. Now, speaking of messiness, let's get to the responsible AI commitments declaration that was released yesterday, which has generated an absolute boatload of chatter. Hemant Tanasia, the CEO of General Catalyst, tweets, Today, 35-plus VC firms and another 15-plus companies, representing hundreds of billions in capital, have signed the Voluntary Responsible AI Commitments from Responsible Labs, RIL, the nonprofit I co-founded. As chairman of RIL, I'm proud to unveil this today with tech leaders and Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo in San Francisco. These commitments include, one, a general commitment to responsible AI, including internal governance, two, appropriate transparency and documentation, three, risk and benefit forecasting, 
four, auditing and testing, five, feedback cycles and ongoing improvements. In addition to the commitments, we are publishing a 15-page responsible AI protocol, a practical how-to playbook to help investors and startups alike fulfill the commitments. Since April, our steering group of cross-societal AI experts has worked hard to understand the unique considerations and relevant and realistic standards for technologists at any stage. We strongly believe in the power of AI to transform our world for the better. Our role as investors is to advocate for our startups and the innovation economy from day one. Everybody saw the executive order last month. The reaction in the Valley has generally been to denounce it. The reality is that right now it's largely just reporting requirements. However, there is a risk that devolves into regulation that slows innovation down and makes America and its businesses uncompetitive. But the right path forward is not to be antagonistic towards D.C. We in the Valley need to learn that this is not about regulation versus innovation, but about innovation at the intersection of technology, policy, and capital. We have to embrace collaboration with our elected leaders. And as investors, we must hold ourselves accountable for what we fund and found. We are facing what is likely to be the quickest adoption of any new technology ever in AI. It's difficult to think about the regulatory framework that protects the pace of innovation, as well as protects against any nefarious use cases of technology. While we all learn how this role of technology evolves, it's important for us to be intentional about the mindset and mechanisms used in building early-stage companies as both investors and founders. We can't wait or kick the can down the road. Now, this also came with an announcement document, Responsible AI Commitments for Startups and Their Investors. The Responsible AI Commitments include securing organizational buy-in, i.e. implementing internal governance, fostering trust through transparency, i.e. documenting decisions about how and why AI systems are built or adopted, forecasting AI risks and benefits, taking reasonable steps to identify the foreseeable risks and benefits of technologies, audit and test to ensure product safety. Under that, they write, Based on forecasted risks and benefits, we will undertake regular testing to ensure our systems are aligned with responsible AI principles. Testing will include auditing of data and our system's outputs, including harmful bias and discrimination, and documenting those results. We will use adversarial testing, such as red teaming, to identify potential risks. Finally, make regular and ongoing improvements. We will implement appropriate mitigations while monitoring their efficacy, as well as adopting feedback mechanisms to maintain a responsible AI strategy that keeps pace with evolving norms, technologies, and business objectives. Now, there were a few spattered quote tweets and posts of support, including this one from Brandon Goldman, who is a partner of AI Safety at Lionheart BC and writes, This is an excellent step forward. I've been wanting collaboration of safety commitments between investors and companies for safer AI for a long time. I'm excited to see what happens here. However, by far, when it comes to Silicon Valley's builder community, the reactions were extremely negative. Amjad Massad, the CEO at Replit, said, This is at best busy work, and founders should be very suspicious of VCs who ask them to do busy work to support their virtue signaling. And this was a really common theme, that this was either A, proto-regulation, in which case it should be rejected, or B, toothless virtue signaling, in which case it should be rejected. A16Z's Martin Casado says, Will never sign. Preemptively regulating innovations in computer science in ways that can hurt open source innovation and competition is wrong. PhD Casey Hanmer says, Charitably, this is an attempt at forming an AI cartel to reduce valuations. Posterity will see this as about as useful and moral as banning books for having dangerous ideas that might corrupt the youth. And indeed, uncharitably, Ada Pi writes, always follow the money. Here's the short list of VCs struggling to raise their next fund and hoping signing this and saying they're into AI gets at least one LP over the line. Now for entrepreneurs, this had maybe the exact opposite of the intended effect. Martin Screlly writes, new do not call list just dropped. Investors of last resort would be another name. Indeed, then Martin continued, here is a much, much better list of investors with much more capital that aren't brainwashed. Some other investors appealed to history. Steven Sanofsky said, everyone reading this should be thankful this mindset did not prevail at the advent of the microprocessor, the database, the PC, the internet, mobile phones, and so on. Each step, there were those that championed caution over innovation. And it wasn't just A16Z who was using this as a wedge to say we're different and you should work with us instead. Other investors also signaled their pledge not to sign these commitments. Julie Fredrickson wrote, I've signed nothing. I make no pledges to any ethical standards set by anyone else but my own conscience and my faith in other men and women of conscience. Julie also added, remember when Google's public relations campaign was don't be evil? How'd that turn out? Maybe we can learn some lessons and apply to concerns about artificial intelligence. Now, outside of just the foundational principle kind of arguments, some folks tried to focus on specific problems. Fast.ai founder Jeremy Howard wrote, the big problem is point four, which is audit and test to ensure product safety regularly. Jeremy continues, It is literally impossible to ensure safety of a general purpose model, and attempts to do so are likely to reduce safety. Jeremy actually also wrote a long piece about this back in July called AI Safety and the Age of Disenlightenment. Model licensing and surveillance will be counterproductive by concentrating power in unsustainable ways. Now, Balaji weighed in on this as well, writing, Free internet means free AI. I like Hammond and many of the people on this proposal. 
but fundamentally disagree with the philosophy of capitulation therein. We will fight government control over compute with everything we have. Because we have just been treated to the mother of all bait and switches, where AGI was used to somehow justify a new TSA. The true purpose of this executive order has nothing to do with avoiding existential risk, everything to do with gaining existential control. Remember, this government is the generator of existential risks, not the regulator thereof. As there is still no accountability for funding the development of COVID-19 in a Wuhan biolab, exactly how can it regulate anything when it can't regulate itself? Rather than immediate capitulation, this coalition would be much better served if it was A, suing the federal government over the illegitimacy of an order that essentially regulates speech and logic itself, and B, working with smart governors in pro-tech states abroad to set up intelligent pro-AI environments. The fight for free, decentralized AI will be like the fight for encryption and a free internet. And we will win, because 640k of compute isn't enough for everyone. Basically, there is a strong undercurrent here that this represents a push for more government control and that this self-regulatory proposal is effectively capitulation with it. Now, meanwhile, there is a whole separate issue going on that is not actually about self-regulatory principles and a voluntary declaration, but is about what ends up in the EU AI Act and what big tech lobbying efforts are trying to produce there. But that, I think, will be the subject for another show. For today, the relevant recap is just that this is a growing conversation. It's growing in terms of how broadly people are participating. It's growing in terms of the stakes. In other words, now is a good time to start paying attention and getting involved because someone will win the conversation and the world of the future will be shaped by who it is. Thanks as always for listening or watching. And until next time, peace.